This is Start Disrupting, a show about the innovator, scientist, and designers disrupting industries and creating 10x impact. I'm your host, Brett Malone, President and CEO of the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Today on the show is Pete Kadushin. He's a mental performance coach. Pete has a fantastic background of athletics, including rock climbing, summiting mountains, trail running, but he also works with business professionals to help them understand how to up their game. We're going to focus our conversation on entrepreneurship, upping your mental performance and your mental game to make your business successful and learning and knowing when to pivot or when to persist. We also talk a little bit about what it means to effectively use your time, build teams, and really make yourself successful to be able to grow in a durable way. Pete, welcome to the show. Uh, Brett, thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, really excited to talk about the eight inches between your ears. That's right. Well, there's a lot there and uh, it's a short distance, but a lot there. And, and frankly, the idea, the concept of mental performance coaching, tell me a little bit about how you landed in this spot. Well, I, uh, I was an athlete all through well, basically growing up and I played just about everything. I'm, I love just competition in general. Uh, and what I realized at a certain point was that there were days where I could bring it and there were days where I couldn't. And physically, I was more or less the same person. And so, you know, my dad's a psychologist and the language of psychology was in the house. And, you know, I'm sure he did some experiments on me at some point that I don't remember. Uh, but, you know, we <laughs> talked about... That's how we you talked ended about, up the way you are. <laughs> that's exactly how I ended up the way I am. We talked about the mind. And, and so it was a natural extension then to think about the role that your mind has in performance. Uh, and from there, I did what any good geeky high schooler would do is I went and bought a book at Barnes and Noble and started reading. And that really kicked off what's now been a, a several decades long journey into trying to understand the factors in between your ears that influence performance. And then really trying to think about what skills and drills can I be doing? And then what can I share with the people I work with that are going to allow them to think better, to focus better, to control their energy more effectively uh, and another shout out to my dad, you know, it started with athletics, but what he really shared with me early on was that, you know, life is performance. And so whether it's public speaking or leading a small team, uh, trying to build something really special as an entrepreneur, right, that we're performing almost all day, every day. And so the mental skills that I first used as an athlete and then share with athletes, uh, they really carry over pretty seamlessly to the tactical athletes and first responders I work with. Uh, and then certainly the the folks in in business that I've connected with as well. So I'm I'm going to stop right here because some of our listeners will already have heard enough and want to learn more. Your website is drkcoaching.com, and uh, but we want listeners to stick to the show here. So we're going to dive into a couple things that you've learned from athletic and performance coaching that are applicable in my mind, knowing you to entrepreneurship, and I think it's important because. I had the privilege of being on your show, and I think I made a comment that Leadville was about 80% mental. And, uh, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're out there trying to start a business, it takes a ton of grit and it takes a ton of uh, tenacity. And, you know, frankly, my experiences and the experience that I see in a pretty common format is uh, it, it's kind of lonely to be right at the beginning of trying to start a company. So, as you think about somebody at the precipice, right at the beginning of their journey of starting a company, formulating an idea and, you know, taking that first step, stepping off into that journey, where do they need to be mentally to try to be resilient and, you know, be able to, to be durable through that whole storm? It's a great question. And I think that one of the really potent, places to start is to recognize and recalibrate your expectations. And I think it's really easy for us to miss the environment or miss some of the choices we made and how that influences the way we're thinking about our experience. And we end up with unreasonable expectations. And when our expectations don't meet reality, that's really a recipe for suffering. And so when we're thinking about a 
somebody who's right on that precipice, who has the idea and is getting ready to really take the ball and run with it. I'm going to end up using a ton of sports analogies. So you'll have to roll with me. Mm -hmm. Uh, that the choice of being an entrepreneur comes with some of that loneliness that's cooked into the experience because oftentimes you're creating something that fits your vision, but may not uh, be something that other people see quite yet. And so you're spending a lot of time convincing people that this actually is a brilliant idea. Uh, you may not have a lot of support. And even if you do have support, right, you're still going home and your idea is with you at the end of the day and the rest of your team or the people that you're bringing in to help you right? They're not necessarily going to be there throughout the, the lonely evening as you're thinking about, will this float or won't it? And up front, I think there's just a lot of value to saying, well, is that part of the experience that I want? Because mm -hmm. right. there are certainly things we can do to change your mindset and help you roll with the experience, but that some of that experience is just going to be part of your journey. And, yeah. and up front, yeah. you want to decide, am I signing up for that journey or is there a different one that I want? Yeah, I'm thinking also that a lot of times uh, an entrepreneur in, in their early days, they, they tend to get a lot of the flow state, like what we've talked about, because there's a lot of creativity, there's a lot of learning, there's a growth mindset that's baked into anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur. And so you have these moments where you're just flying through your plan and things are moving and flowing. And, you know, that's not, never really a lonely period, but then you can't always be in flow state. And so, you know, when you come down off of that and there's the grind of, okay, well, how do I finish this off or how do I re outreach or how do I start to build the team? You know, that's where the resilience really needs to come in. Well, I think we, we do a really good job of thinking about the highs and going like, yeah, that's, that's the rock star experience that I want. I want more flow state. I want more recognition for the awesome stuff that I'm thinking about building or building or have built. And again, coming back to recalibrating expectations, uh, I think we don't always pay attention to what is it going to feel like when it's low? Are those the types of problems that I actually want to have to wrestle with? Because right. you know, I think uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, I'm pretty sure the Buddha said, uh, life is eating just crap sandwich after crap sandwich. <laughs> and so it's really, it's about, it's about picking the sandwich that you want to eat. Because yeah. right? we're not going to dodge challenges, we're not going to dodge problems or suffering. And so it becomes a matter of uh, if I'm signing up for the grind, is it the grind that I'm actually passionate enough or engaged enough or excited enough to move through? Because that's really, when we think about resilience or grit and motivation, it's, it's that exactly, right? Is I'm willing to persist through the hard times to get to the good stuff. Right. So I want to get real specific because we want this to be helpful for our entrepreneurs, especially our young ones that are out there thinking or already engaged in starting the business. So a lot of times you'll get excited, you'll have an initial idea and maybe it's not the best idea, but you know, it, it comes in that spark of creativity, but usually uh, a business goes through multiple iterations or pivots that we would call them. And as they, as they sort of pivot through their business models, eventually you would land on something a little more optimal. So what your first idea generally is not going to be what you go to market with. But at the same time, you have to have some persistence to be able to manage other people's criticism and not give up too easily. How can our entrepreneurs think about managing that process as, as a, a mental performance uh, approach? Again, some really, really good questions to be asking and considering. And I want to start back where we, we began, which is uh, one of the joys of entrepreneurship is that you're the one who's deciding, is this an idea that I want to stick with? Do I want to persist? Right? Or is it time to pivot? And if that's the crux of the question, do I stick with an idea or do I iterate or do I abandon the idea altogether? Uh, it's useful to recognize that if you're working for somebody else, you don't have that power and that freedom. Uh, but with great power comes great responsibility. You're now where the buck stops when it comes to making decisions about an idea or a business. Mm -hmm. And so starting there and then really working backwards and thinking about sort of being of two minds, right? Having the capacity to inhabit two different modes, even as the same human, uh, without having to negate one or the other. Uh, and so, you know, if you're thinking of a brainstorming process or the experience of allowing yourself to fall into flow, and there's some really reliable flow triggers. 
to get you into that space, that there's a certain level of that editor or the, the self-critic, that voice that goes, mm, maybe that idea is not that great, that you've turned the volume down on. And you also, or especially early on when you don't necessarily have a group of people around you to provide the editing perspective, you have to be able to shift into the editor mode and go like, all right, that idea felt really good last night at two in the morning when I couldn't sleep, <laughs> right? And yeah. do I have, I think this, this part for me is really important. Do I have clear criteria in terms or a clear system of thinking through my ideas so that I can evaluate whether or not they're actually good? I think that's a really good approach because we, do, we don't want to eliminate creativity or ideas. I mean, you've got to throw a lot at the wall, but then you have to edit it. You have to like hone it down and, and you know, be able to select the ones that, that have merit. And, and also, you know, in, in our business, you have to be able to, to continually refine. Well, and if we want to really make this concrete, um, finding time where you can schedule creative time, right? If the, your calendar is your master, yeah. Right. Then using that to create space where you, cause I'm a big fan of boundaries and thresholds because if we're trying to both create and edit at the same time, uh, you might as well just put your foot on the brake and the gas and then see what happens to your car engine. Right. It's not going to turn out because you're not getting ideas that are far enough outside of the box that they might work, but you're also not then uh, editing as effectively and really going through with fidelity going through the process of understanding an idea from that perspective of, is this actually going to, to make the cut? Yeah. And so on, on your schedule, actually peeling this apart and giving yourself a chance to say, okay, for the next hour, right? Cause you can't do it in five to 10 minute increments, right? You really need some time to relax into the creative process mm -hmm. for the next hour, next 90 minutes. Right? The thing I'll be doing is, and you know, I'll be creating and there doesn't have to be a wrong idea. Anything that right. is useful gets on the whiteboard or anything that's useful gets dumped into my notebook and then schedule your editing time so that you don't cross the wires and end up stuck trying to do both at the same time. Yeah. I think that's so important. Uh, you know, time management and creating effective calendars. There, there's a lot of work. There's a, there's a whole body of work that's gone into that. And, you know, this concept of maker or manager schedules or calendars. And, and we find ourselves if you're not careful, you could get dragged down the route of just managing and go, attending meetings without purpose and losing a lot of that creative schedule that you have early on. And, and an entrepreneur is, has a finite amount of time and how you, you know, people think about raising capital and raising money and, and that's going to help. But frankly, you know, your investment of time is the most, is the number one piece of capital you can give your company. I, I want to pick on one thing that you said, and then we can riff a little bit more on this makers and manager schedule. Uh, I think that time is certainly an important resource, but it's really time plus attention, right? Because if I'm giving time to my business, but my attention is really low quality, right? Or if I haven't clarified right. what my intention is in terms of this meeting or this creative time, uh, then that time ends up being worth less. Right. And so, you know, if nothing else, folks who are listening to this, if they can walk away by understanding that the more I can connect to the experience I'm having, the work that I'm trying to do right now, the more present I can be to the experience, mm -hmm. uh, generally the better it goes. In terms of that makers and managers, I think one of the seductive traps, and you pointed to it, is that we look around and we see other people who are really busy. And there becomes this sense that if I'm not putting out fires if I'm not being reactive and going from meeting to meeting and then, you know, checking my phone and checking this and sending text messages and Slack and all the other things that can grab our attention and make us feel productive, right? We lose track of what's important right. and urgent, what's important and not urgent, right? And we get stuck in the urgent and not important category. Well, yeah. And I expand that idea because you immediately start creating the culture for your company. And so your, your company is what you do and your, your culture is what you do. And so you will quickly become a role model for anyone that you hire. So when you think about setting the tone, you do want to set a tone for, you know, sort of purposeful thought. And so, you know, that culture begins from day one. Well, and I actually have a story. I, 
I walked by an executive's office one time and there was a note on the door that said, email gets checked at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. I'm, I'm trying to create the space to be able to do the hard work. And when I knocked on the door and walked in, uh, the iPhone had a stand and then the iPad had a stand and then there were two monitors and I could see the email was open on one of them. And so, you know, the, again, kudos for trying to build those boundaries. Right? But like you said, people are watching mm-hmm. and every person who walked by that office and looked in and saw that there wasn't the actual space being created mm-hmm. goes, well, oh, may- maybe that's what we're about. Maybe that's what we ought to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Ben Horowitz uh, has a, a book out that really talks a lot about culture and, you know, for young entrepreneurs looking at that, we'll put this in the show notes, but it really builds on that concept that, you know, your culture derives from what you do and this managing the creative space, building the company. As you build your company, you will need to have uh, operators on your team that, that really think very much about managing your business and managing the customer engagement. So uh, both are critical, but knowing the distinction between the two, I, I think that's the big rule is understand what kind of time you're investing in, and understand what you know, again, to your, to your point, things that we've talked about in the past and meeting etiquette, knowing what your role is in a meeting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a low hanging fruit in that to get everybody on the same page via email prior to a meeting could take, I mean, to type the email, it probably takes 30 seconds. And then for everybody to pause and go, well, what, what am I particularly bringing to this meeting that's going to allow us to achieve the clarified objective? And it, it isn't that hard, but it's t- difficult to have the discipline to start each meeting with a clear objective and to bring some intentionality to it. I want to circle all the way back around to our first topic because, it, you know, we've taken the entrepreneur from sort of the, the lonely initial phase into having a team. And now we're, you know, we, we've got different types of meetings and time management. Let's go back around though, because if you're an entrepreneur, your vision that you have never dies. And, you know, your vision, you have to have persistence around the vision of what you're trying to build as a company. And so this, the pivot or persist uh, issue never really goes away. In fact, you know, you have to have the vision and then communicate to your team what that vision is. So as you think about the mental uh, training and the exercises and the ability to help your team see what you see. And a lot of times they don't. A lot of times there has to be trust. I mean, we, we have to build relationships around trust that this vision is right. And, you know, a lot of times an entrepreneur can be very lonely with, among a very big team because they may feel like they're either getting criticized if they're not articulating the vision accurately, or if the team's not behind them, now that person feels lonely because again, they're in that same space of, well, should I turn this into a services business or should I sell the software or should I just license it and give it away? Tell some of our entrepreneurs who have started to get traction, they've got teams, how do they think about the, the, the mental training necessary to, to balance that? I think what you're pointing to is that there's a, a base skill set when it comes to the, the mindset and mental skills. Uh, that can really map over the life cycle of a business or an entrepreneur's career, but it's going to look different at those different stages of the life cycle of a business. So that same capacity to be mentally flexible, right? To be able to invest fully in an idea as you're gaining Mm -hmm. that creative momentum, but then to be able to step back and create space and some separation from an idea and go, actually, was it, was it that good? That same ability to be deeply in it and then also create that Zoom function where you can pull out and see from a slightly more dispassionate 30 or 40,000 foot view. And I think that is something that you absolutely can train. And and by doing it early, you're going to, again, reap the benefits because there's that compound interest of if you're making better decisions early in the life cycle of the business, then you're going to be in a better position two months from now, six months from now, a year from now. Mm -hmm. And so then to dig into the details, how do you build some of that flexibility? I think there's two different things I would recommend. The first is to develop some form of mindfulness practice. And I know that it's the hot topic these days 
uh, and it has gotten a lot of traction in sort of pop culture. But the reason why mindfulness ends up being critical when we think about this particular scenario is that what you're doing when you're practicing mindfulness is you're learning to create space from your thoughts. You're no longer identifying with the thought that just floated through your mind. And so for an entrepreneur who's feeling lonely early in the, thought, uh, the, the life cycle of their business, right, to not fully adopt this sense of, I am my business. And when it's doing well, I'm doing well. When it's doing terribly, I'm doing terribly. Right? But instead, to be able to create a little bit of separation while at the same time being deeply engaged in the success and wanting the success of that idea. And then you can fast forward that and look at the experience of someone who's got a team around them and is a little bit further along the path, their ability to receive feedback without feeling like that feedback is directly attacking them, right? their ability to solicit people to go and uh, in the military, they call it red teaming. So here's my idea. I want you to tear it apart, right? I want you to find all the holes, all the spaces where I might've missed in terms of blind spots, right? To solicit that type of feedback, you have to have a certain bit of dispassion. And Mm -hmm. again, it's balancing that deep investment with the dispassion as opposed to unplugging your motivation so that somebody can then go take a crack at your idea. And so the first recommendation would be even if it was just two minutes a day of finding some quiet time and paying attention to something on purpose. Uh, So the breath is often the anchor, but you could just pick doing the dishes or folding your laundry or whatever it is that you can be fully present to. And the practice is to bring your attention to that anchor. When your attention wanders, because what your mind does is creates thoughts and feelings. It's a thought feeling machine. When your mind wanders, you simply bring it back. That's it. And notice that it was a thought that dragged you off, not reality. By noticing thoughts as thoughts, we can start to create that valuable separation between what just happened and then my automatic reaction, which then is where all the magic happens when it comes to making better decisions, connecting with people and sharing vision. And so that would be, that would be recommendation number one. I like that. I think you know, what I know about you is you, you operate in very practical terms. And so we, we'd love to be able to put some additional pointers or exercises or lessons in our notes to be able to, you know, call that out. And, and I think that's a really good, simple way. People overlook the basics of just staying focused or being present. And um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I've taken on and I really appreciate have found helpful for me is sort of this gratitude. So, you know, the, the concept of, and I do this in the morning, I think, you know, I'm usually on my run, I'm usually getting some of my endorphins and moving. But frankly, you know, I found that reflecting from a position of gratitude of what's going right, you know, everyone wants to focus on solving the problems of the day. And don't worry, you know, you'll get to that list. But, you know, start from a perspective of, you know, gratitude that opens your mind to, in order to be able to, to, to go into that growth mindset, you know, what, what we find is without that base of gratitude, it's much more difficult to get into that growth mindset. Mm. And I think that it works because our mind adopts the habits. What we do more of, we do more of. Right. And, and in terms of our attentional filter, you know, if you've ever heard a song on the radio and then all of a sudden hear it eight more times in the next two days, you go, oh man, they're just playing that song a lot. The truth is they were playing it a lot before you heard it the first time. You just didn't notice it. And the same thing is true about practicing gratitude or noticing what's going right is that we can start to train our mind to have a more balanced view of the world because there's generally going to be things to be grateful for and things to be frustrated about at any given time. And so it's really about recalibrating that filter so that you can notice a wider band of experience. Mm-hmm. as opposed to being stuck in, here's the 1% of the things that aren't going correctly. Mm-hmm. And that actually brings me to uh, what I think is another really important practical tool that we don't do very well unless we're trying to really pay attention on purpose to doing it better. And that's that systematic reflection to really right. set aside some time with a system, right? Because we're going to ruminate on what didn't go well, right? Anybody who's type A and is really trying to create something big and important they're going to have a lot of their attention funneled towards that idea, right? Instead, what I'm, I'm talking about is setting aside time, even if it's just five minutes, 
to think about what did I do well, what could I do better, and how am I going to do it better tomorrow? And then I can close the book on that mm-hmm. and know that I've, I've used a system that I trust to make sure that I'm just getting a little bit better tomorrow, that my thought process and my decision making is a little bit better, right? Whatever I want to aim that reflection at, but I have to have a systematic reflection because otherwise I'm leaving all sorts of improvement on the table. And right. I'm probably also kicking the crap out of myself for the, the one little mistake instead of noticing all of the stuff that I could also be grateful for. Right. Yeah. And you know, um, you bring up a good point because this incremental improvement, systemic improvement, you know, I, I know your, your guests on your podcast, really, uh, the, the latest guests that you've had on your podcast, really, uh, she called that out in terms of being able to see that 1%. And some people don't see that. And they, they f- get frustrated because they don't feel like they're making improvement. But this systematic reflection could start to bring that out, I imagine. Well, and I, it really goes back to that conversation we were just having around the entrepreneur in the middle of their life cycle, right? And how do you pivot or persist? Is this shift from being purely outcome focused to finding a way to improve the process every day? Right. Because this idea may not end up being the world changing idea. Right? But if I improve my system every time I make a decision, and if I improve the decision making of my, my company, which becomes its own organism at a certain point, right? And you, mm-hmm. you even spoke to this idea that it can be self optimizing if we design it correct, mm-hmm. right? That by really focusing on process improvements in between my own ears, I'm not just focusing on did I get to the top of the mountain right here, but it's how often can I get to the top of the mountain? And I pick a new mountain, whether right. it's a new business or a, you have to pivot. So I'm going to unpack a couple things that I heard that I think can be really helpful for our CRC community. So here at the CRC, you know, we take culture and community very, very seriously. And one of the things that our community does really well is it helps support risk takers. You know, so we call ourselves the game changers, disruptors, right? I mean, we're, we're owning that and we, we have a tremendous amount of pride. The CRC has pride in community. Uh, But one of the things that we also receive people in who, you know, maybe they didn't make it to the top of the mountain on the first shot, you know, and and it's, it's really tough to come back into a community when you've attempted something and, you know, to use the F word, uh, you know, failed. But, you know, failure really is just uh, uh, the beginning of something that's next in my mind. And so we talk a lot about that growth. So if I go all the way back around this, though, if you proclaim to our community that you are an entrepreneur or you are starting a company, or maybe you're starting your second or third company, you know, there's a lot of pressure that comes with just declaring yourself that title. No one else gives you that title. Only you can give yourself that title of entrepreneur and I'm going to start something new. And so, you know, mentally there, even subconsciously, there's a pressure that comes with that title. And so, you know, you have to, manage that, that sort of internal pressure that's generated. So I, I don't know that I have a specific question in mind, but that in, when you think about mental performance, managing that pressure and not, you know, being able to balance this vision, this grit, this persistence, along with receiving, you know, being part of this elite community and making sure that you're performing the way you think the community expects you to perform. There's an interesting sort of meta level thing happening in my head right now because I just left my teaching position about a year ago and I'm in the process of building a business. And so I guess I get to declare right here that I'm technically an entrepreneur at this point. And so recognizing that pressure, recognizing that sense of even within the context of community, feeling like you're out on a limb and feeling that extra sense of something's on the line is very real. And in terms of pressure and what that does, right? Pressure for me really comes back to what's happening as you respond to it. So pressure comes from feeling like the stakes are high. Mm -hmm. When people thrive in pressure, it's because they can recognize that their skills can meet the challenge. Mm -hmm. When they struggle around pressure, it's because they can see how big the challenge is, but they fail to recognize or fail to cultivate the skills that they have that would allow them to meet it. And so if you think about Olympic level athletes, 
It's not that they're not nervous before a gold medal match. It's that they handle the pressure and are able to channel that in a meaningful way. And so if we walk backwards from that, how is it working for you? Is that sense of expectation within the community of the CRC, is that helping push you a little bit more so that you're more present, more motivated, right? More connected to the work you're doing, or is it getting in the way? And so trying to stay away from good or bad or positive or negative, but is it productive? In terms of reflection, going back and being able to pay attention to, is this productive pressure? Or are my expectations actually getting in the way of doing a higher level job? Right. Well, you know, filling in the skills gap is where the team building really comes in. And, and we get a lot of entrepreneurs who come over. I mean, obviously, Virginia Tech and the CRC is a very technology oriented community. So we have engineers, scientists, and, you know, very driven on the technical side. So there's no there's no problem we can identify and, and solve Laplace's equation and, and whatever else needs to be solved. But <laughs> when it, there's, there's also a lot of skills gap that we see with young startups because they've gone through this highly technical track and they've got a PhD in engineering and they start a company and now they need these skills like communication skills or, you know, team building skills or business development. And, there's a balance between how much do you personally try to reinforce yourself or, you know, learn those skills versus start to build the team. And a lot of the advice that we give our young entrepreneurs are, and, and you hear this almost daily where somebody brilliant comes across and somewhere along the way, whether it's a venture capitalist or somebody just trying to give creative, you know, helpful advice. Like, oh, well, you need to hire a CEO. And it's like, you know, you can take that advice two different ways. It's like, well, no, this is my company, right? And, but at the same time, the advice is really meaning like, well, you need to hire somebody to counterbalance your skill or, or to add or complement your skill. And so, you know, we could just keep going down this rabbit hole, P. You know, <laughs> it's like really exciting to think about. But these are the real world issues that I believe our entrepreneurs deal with daily. So, you know, they, they manage through it and, and we're trying to be really helpful with advice. And first of all, let them know they're not alone. Uh, secondly, let them know that there are tools and lessons and skills that they can develop. And, you know, from your perspective, the mental performance of acknowledging, reflecting, systematically getting into that, that uh, evaluation process, it, it's necessary. It, you know, this is important stuff because you've got to be able to cultivate that engine that, uh, that eight inches between your ears, you said. That's right. That's right. And you're going back to the, the power of reflection, being able to be honest with yourself and say, that's a skill set that I can develop, or maybe a skill set that I already have that I'm not giving myself credit for, right? You need to be able to see that, but you also have to notice and, and be able to recognize and be upfront with yourself when you say, that's a skill set I don't have. And it is mm-hmm. time for me to bring in a CEO, right? Or a COO or whatever else might actually really round out the organization. And so that level of honesty and being comfortable with not being, because the truth is your superpower lives right next to your super weakness, right? And so do you really want to be a jack of all trades, or do you want to build a team where everybody's got superpowers and then you cover for each other's super weaknesses? Mm-hmm. Uh, that takes being honest. And I think honesty like that is something that you can build systematically by reflecting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. You know, I, I think it was horrible. I forget who had the original comment about, uh, you know, evaluating not on your absence of weakness and, and uh, you know, this concept. I love that. We, we may just now have a title for this show. Your, your superpower sits right beside your super weakness. I dig and, it. And, uh, you know, we're just really trying to provide some, some real world tools. What else, as, as we kind of wrap this up, what else should entrepreneurs who are dealing with 9,000 things a day, trying to manage their time, trying to manage their, their grit, trying to maintain a vision and, and meet what they perceive as expectations of the community? No, no pressure there, right? What, yeah. What, what are some things that they can sort of be thinking about and how do you sort of help put it in perspective? And then, uh, you know, as, in terms of engaging with you and follow up, is that an opportunity for some of these entrepreneurs? Yeah. So to start with, I think the, the lasting message is that first your mind matters and we already have experiences we can all point to that really make that clear, right? That how I'm thinking and how I engage what happens in between my ears 
changes the way that I engage other people and my, my business. And so knowing that there are levers and buttons to play with is really important because it puts control back in your hands. Mm -hmm. And the second piece is that mental training is a lot like physical training. And so being able to, rather than walking away from this and going, all right, well, I need to get a mindfulness practice and then I need to make sure I reflect every day and I'm going to do it for 45 minutes, even though I don't have 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. That a little bit each day in terms of building consistency and momentum uh, that you want to start where you're successful. So if you only have two minutes to pay attention on purpose to train that, right, that's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it really comes back to finding ways to improve the process just a little bit today. Uh, in terms of your mental skills and the, your thought process, uh, because that's going to really build momentum and compound over time. In terms of follow-up, I love what I do. I absolutely just, the opportunity to help other people level up and raise their game in between their ears, they can go make impact and disrupt and game change, right? Whether it's on the field or it's in the boardroom, right? That for me is really exciting opportunity. So if folks feel like uh, developing a mental training plan is going to be something that's going to be helpful for, helpful for them, uh, by all means, uh, drop by the website, send me a, a connect form, or uh, you can hop right on and, and grab a consultation so that we could sit down for 20 minutes and figure out how mental training would be helpful. From firsthand experience, you know, Pete, your, your input, your guidance, your ability to help unpack what's there and, and especially take someone who's been dealing with a lot of issues and try to sort them, unpack in, in practical tools to help you make sure that you stay organized. And, and I think that's most important. So I'd, I'd highly encourage anyone who's uh, been interested in what they've heard today to, to look up uh, Pete. It's under drkcoaching.com. And uh, Pete, it's uh, a pleasure to have you on the show. I, I am certain we will have you back. I'm certain that uh, we may even get you involved at some level in our Game Changers event that's coming up at the end of August. Pete, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's an honor. Thank you for all that you do out there. And thanks for the message for our uh, game changers that are right here in the CRC. Yeah, to everybody listening, just uh, stick with it. You don't have to do it alone. And uh, to you, Brett, thanks so much for the time and the opportunity. I love this stuff. Pete, always Mach 2 with his hair on fire. That's Pete Kadushin. And that's it for this episode. Subscribe to Start Disrupting wherever you get your podcasts. We have a new disruptor on our show every two weeks, and you're not going to want to miss it. Check out vtcrc.com for the latest on our research park and over 225 companies that call us home. Until next time, always change the game.